Unit 6.1, Beam Stress, the Flexure Formula. In this unit, we are going to focus on the outcome, demonstrate the ability to calculate normal and shear stress and deflection in beams. In this lesson, we will apply the flexure formula to calculate normal stress in beams. In the previous unit, we focused on constructing shear and bending moment diagrams, either using the direct equation method or the graphical method. The purpose of these diagrams is to visualize how the internal shear and the internal moment change over the length of the beam. Once we have our shear and bending moment diagrams constructed, we can calculate the internal normal stress or internal shear stress that results as a function of either the internal bending moment at some point in the beam or the internal shear force at some point in the beam. First, let's begin by discussing sign convention and axis direction. Here's a beam, and we are going to show the x-axis as running along the longitudinal axis of the beam. Then our positive y-axis will be pointing upward. There is also a z-axis that is pointing out of the screen at the origin. Let's make a cross-section through this beam. We are now looking down towards the origin of the x-axis, which is now coming out of the screen. And that x-axis is going to pass through the centroid of the beam cross-section. In this rectangular-shaped beam, the centroid will be right in the middle. And we can plot the y-axis as pointing upward. And now we can see the positive z-axis. And we can see that the origin of our coordinate system is at the centroid of the cross-section. We are going to define a plane that exists parallel to the z-axis, which also passes through the centroid of the cross-section. We are going to call this our neutral axis. And the neutral axis passes through the centroid of the cross-section. Now let's introduce the flexure formula. The flexure formula is used to calculate an internal stress as a result of an internal bending moment. Let's define the terms. First of all, we've seen sigma before. Sigma is a normal stress, and it's the normal stress that results from an internal moment. It is also sometimes called a bending stress. But keep in mind, it is not a new type of stress. It is a normal stress that is just produced from bending of the beam. The next term is m. m is the internal resultant moment in the beam at the cross-section where stress is being evaluated. The next variable is y. y is a dimension, typically in inches or meters, and it is the vertical distance from the neutral axis to a point where stress is being evaluated on a cross-section. The last term is I. I is the moment of inertia of the beam cross-section. Now let's discuss each of these variables in more detail and also discuss why this negative sign appears in the equation. Let's first focus on the variable M. M is the internal moment in the beam. Here is a moment diagram for this beam here. We see that the internal moment changes along the length of the beam. We found the moment diagram either using the direct equation method to write an equation or by using the graphical method. Depending on where we want to calculate stress in the beam, we will pick a moment off of the moment diagram. Typically we are interested in the maximum moment because we're typically interested in the finding the maximum stress in the beam since the maximum stress will control the beam design. The maximum moment can easily be found on the bending moment diagram. Now let's talk about the variable y. As previously mentioned, y is a dimension, and it's a dimension on the cross-section. Let's say we are evaluating normal stress at this point here, along section AA. When we look at the cross-section, the stress is going to vary with some distance from the neutral axis. y is the vertical distance from the point where we are evaluating stress from the neutral axis. 
you can see from the equation that if we are evaluating stress at the neutral axis, y would be equal to 0, which means the stress on the neutral axis is 0. If we go above the neutral axis, then y is going in the positive y direction. Any point in this blue area will have a positive value of y. The farther we get from the neutral axis, the larger y will be, and the larger our stress will be. If we evaluate stress at a point below the neutral axis, then we will be in the negative y region. Any point in this red area will have a negative value of y, and that negative value will be included when we write y in the flexure formula equation. Now, let's talk about the last variable, i, or the moment of inertia. Various references can be found for the moments of inertia of different shapes. For example, here are four shapes shown. Uh, the top one is a rectangular shape. We see that the moment of inertia of a rectangular shape is equal to b, that's the base dimension, that's the dimension that is parallel to the neutral axis. h is the height dimension, that's the dimension that's perpendicular to the neutral axis. We see that the height is cubed. We see that the height plays a very big role in calculating a value for moment of inertia. So what does moment of inertia do in the Fletcher formula? Well, we see that when the moment of inertia increases for a given moment and value for y, the stress decreases. Now this is logical because if we want to decrease the stress in a beam, we can increase the cross section by using a larger beam that'll have a bigger value for moment of inertia, and therefore we will get smaller stress. Physically what the moment of inertia is calculating is how much material in the cross section is present at a distance away from the neutral axis. That's why this value of h is so important in this equation. As h increases, our moment of inertia also increases rapidly since h is cubed. And the bigger h gets, the more material there is at a distance away from the neutral axis, where it can resist the internal moment. Now let's discuss why this negative sign appears in our flexure formula. Let's suppose again that we have a beam that is supporting a uniformly distributed load. If we were to draw the moment diagram, it would look like this. You can see that the moment diagram is positive over the entire length of the beam. Now let's suppose the beam has a rectangular cross section. Let's consider what the deformed shape of this beam would look like. It's supported at the ends with the load, it's going to bend. And the deflected shape will look something like this. Now, the deflection is exaggerated in this picture, just for clarity. I've drawn the neutral axis onto the beam. You can see that the neutral axis is going to take this curved shape. In fact, other lines that were initially horizontal on the beam and parallel to the neutral axis will also take that same curved shape. Look at the vertical lines that are on the beam. Before the beam was deflected, these lines were all vertical, pointing upward. In the deflected shape, we can see that the lines are no longer vertical. But notice that at a given section, the line is still straight, which means the cross section is not warping. Another way to say this is that plane sections remain plane in a beam. This is important to us. We can see that those cross sections appear to be converging near the top of this beam and diverging near the bottom. Let's look at what's going on at the top of this beam. Here is an element that we've taken from the beam and we can see that it has a deformed shape. That deformation must be occurring because of a compression on the element. That compression is creating a normal compressive stress. If you recall from our bending moment diagram, 
the bending moment at this point was positive. In fact, it was positive over the entire beam. So we would stick in the flexure formula equation a positive value for moment at this point. The value for y, because we are plotting above the neutral axis, the value for y is also positive. i, the moment of inertia, is always positive because it's a section property. We see that the negative sign on the flexure formula results in a negative stress in this situation. And that makes sense because the element is being compressed and compression results in a negative normal stress. Now let's consider an element at the bottom of the beam. We can see that that element is being stretched. It's feeling tension forces. Applying the flexure formula, the moment in the beam is still positive because it was positive over the entire length of the beam. But now the sign on y is negative because we are plotting below the neutral axis. This makes the stress come out as positive. And this also makes sense because a tension force produces a positive normal stress or a positive tension stress. That is why the sign is important. If we were to look at what the stress distribution looks like on the cross section when we have a positive internal moment, here at the neutral axis, the stress is zero. Above the neutral axis, the stress is in compression. And it's increasing linearly as we go some distance above the neutral axis. We can see in the equation as y increases, sigma also increases. Below the neutral axis, we get a similar distribution of stress. As we move below the neutral axis, the tension stress increases linearly. In a three-dimensional view of the cross-section, we see that on any horizontal line, the normal stress is uniform. It doesn't vary along the z-axis. It only varies along the y-axis on a given cross-section. Now let's consider a beam like this. It looks like a diving board. If we plotted the shear diagram, it would look something like this. And the moment diagram would then look something like this. And we see that the moment is negative over the entire length of the beam. So what would the deformed shape of the beam look like? Well, it would look like this, bent downward. If we were to zoom in and look at the stress at this point, we would see that the tension and compression have reversed. That's because now we have a negative moment being applied to the beam. When, we, when y is positive, the negative sign results in a positive stress, which is tension. And that makes sense, because the top of the beam is getting stretched, we see, and the bottom is being compressed. Let me now briefly summarize what we learned about deflected shape. When we have a positive moment in our beam, then the deflected shape will be concave upward. That means we will have compression on the top, tension on the bottom. When we have a negative moment in our beam, the deflected shape will be concave downward. That means we have tension on the top and compression on the bottom. One way you can remember this is that when you have a positive moment, the beam smiles at you. When you have a negative moment, the beam frowns at you. Now there are other forms of the flexure formula that you will sometimes see. In the form on the left, the negative sign has been omitted from the equation. In this form of the flexure formula, the sign on stress is not being considered. Sometimes this is just fine. For example, if you are using a steel beam which has similar strength in compression and tension, then the sign doesn't really matter. But if you're using a cast iron beam, which is very strong in compression but very weak in tension, then the sign may indeed matter. In the form of the equation on the right, sigma max is equal to mc over i. In this case, the negative sign has been omitted, and instead of y, we use c, where c is just equal to the maximum value of y. That means that's the point on the cross-section where y is largest.
that will give us the largest value for our stress and that's why we've written it as maximum stress in a cross section. We've been looking at this example beam throughout this lesson. Let's assume some cross-sectional dimensions. It has a height of 0.4 meters, a base dimension of 0.2 meters. We can calculate its moment of inertia by using the equation base times height cubed over 12. The base dimension is always the dimension that is parallel to the neutral axis. The height is then perpendicular to the neutral axis. So the base is 0.2 meters, the height is 0.4 meters, it's cubed, divided by 12, and we get this value for our moment of inertia. You can see the units are meters to the fourth power. Now we can calculate the maximum stress in this beam. The maximum stress will occur where the moment is at a maximum. So our equation is mc over i. The moment is 160 kilonewton meters, or I will put it in this formula as 160,000 newton meters. Our C dimension is our maximum value for Y. It can be either 0.2 meters above the neutral axis or 0.2 meters below the neutral axis. And the moment of inertia we calculated above, we get a value for our answer of 29.9 megapascals. It'll be positive at the bottom of the beam it will be negative at the top of the beam because it's a positive moment. We get compression on the top, tension on the bottom. Notice the units. We have newtons, meters, and another meters at the top. That's newton meters squared. On the bottom, we have meters to the fourth power. Therefore, we get units of newtons per meter squared, or pascal. Now, often the shapes of the beams that we use in engineering are not solid rectangles or circles or so forth. Usually we use eye shapes or hollow squares or tubes and sometimes even T-shaped or other interesting shapes. To calculate the moment of inertia we can use the parallel axis theorem. Many books on mechanics of materials will include an appendix which reviews the parallel axis theorem. To be able to use the parallel axis theorem, the location of the neutral axis must be known. In symmetrical members, like uh, an I-beam or a hollow tube, the neutral axis passes right through the vertical center of the member. But in other members, such as this unsymmetric T-shape, the neutral axis is not located at the vertical center and it must be calculated using this equation here to calculate the vertical distance to the centroid from some arbitrary datum point. Please see the example problems where neutral axis location and moment of inertia are calculated. And we're done.